Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here again, the same day, with you. Um, so what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, I talked this morning about um, the, the way in which uh, ice acts on the, 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 the global climate and what's happening to ice and why it's happening. And I started to talk about um, the ways in which the changes to the ice in the Arctic are having global impacts uh, on our whole climate system and therefore causing effects which we need to really be worried about. Um, they're not, it's not just the ice disappearing by itself. So I started by talking about two effects. One is the um, albedo feedback. That's when, when ice retreats, um, you see uh, a big area of white, which was the ice, is replaced by a big area of dark, uh, which is the open water. And the, a surf, an ice surface reflects fresh, fresh, fresh snow on, on ice, reflects about 80% of the radiation that falls on it, shortwave radiation. So that's called its albedo. So it has an albedo of about 80%. Uh, as the ice gets dirtier, uh, as uh, summer approaches and it starts to melt, it goes down, but it still only goes down to about 50 or 60%. But then as soon as the ice goes completely, the albedo of, of open water is less than 10%. So that means there's a huge amount of energy now being absorbed by the surface that wasn't being absorbed before was being reflected. So that speeds up global warming because it's, it increases the temperature of the planet. So we have a, a, our first positive feedback, positive meaning nasty, uh, which is that the, the retreat of sea ice directly impacts the rate of warming of, of the atmosphere. So I'll go on now. Ah, OK. Uh, uh, to talk about some of the other effects. But first of all, just uh, to start off with, I'll talk about what you see, uh, what change, the, the, real, the changes which happen actually in the ice. If you're working in the ice or trying to do things there, you, the changes that are occurring uh, alter some of the ways in which you, you can act. So I'll just mention those, if I can. Um, First thing is that um, oh, it works. Okay, first thing is that uh, in the winter in the Arctic, it used to be the case that during the winter months, um, the the ice cover was very stable. It was moving under the influence of wind, but because the ice was quite thick, you had a sort of solid mass of ice moving around. Um, but now, because the ice is very thin. You can have this sort of thing happening in the middle of winter. This is March 2013, and during a storm, the entire pack ice cover broke up. And we can see the, um, um, the yellow here is, this is a satellite picture, the yellow is ice, and the blue is open water. That's leads <coughs> produced by the ice being broken up, uh, breaking up under the influence of the wind. Uh, but the ice being too thin to resist that, that the wind forcing and, and you're getting this uh, some mass of leads. Now that makes this ice impossible to work on because uh, scientists are used to doing their work in the Arctic in winter because although uh, it's cold, it's, the weather's stable, you've got 24 hours of daylight in, in March and April and we can, get, we can typically work from ice camps where we fly out and set up a, uh, a camp and we, we fly to and fro from the coast of Alaska, for instance, uh, using the sea ice as a runway. But um, you can't really have a sea ice runway if your runway is going to break up all the time because of uh, storms. So we can no longer consider working on the ice uh, in the traditional way with an aircraft. Um, and. Uh, Instead, um, now, if we want to do some long-term experiment measuring how the ice drifts or how it evolves through the winter, we have to work from an, an ice-strengthened ship. This is a schooner that was uh, ice-strengthened and was chartered. Uh, so all the scientists sit on the ship and they have some huts around the ship 
if the ice breaks up, they retreat to the ship. So drifting ships have become the way to do work on the ice. This is going back to the days of Nansen in the uh, uh, Fram back in 1896. We're having to go back to that. Um, this is the sort of ice camp that still existed in 2007. This was the camp that, where we were underneath it in a submarine. And this is how, how um, enormously complicated an ice camp can be. Uh, in this case, it was supported by ONR, so it was fairly a fair amount of money went into it. So you see a whole load of wooden buildings. Each of them houses six people. You've got a, a generator hut and power line. So you, it's, like an, a, it's like a little village on the ice because every hut's got its own electric light and power line running to it. This is the mess hall and, and laboratory. This is uh, also a laboratory area. And all the rest are uh, huts to live in. And you can see in this case, we were having to use a helicopter to supply it because uh, we, we couldn't be as far out from the ice as we hoped to be um, because uh, we had to be within helicopter range. Uh, this is... Um, going the wrong way. Uh, Here we are, back again. Um, okay, so, so in the past, this sort of hut would be, system would be supplied by, by a fixed-wing aircraft, but now we're having to do a short-range run by helicopter. Um, then uh, another change, which is an unfortunate one, is that it's easier to look for oil. Um, these days, <coughs> the, the method that is used in in the coastal seas of the Arctic is that uh, is using a drill ship and this one on the left here is a circular ice strengthened drill ship and um, it's it's anchored uh, in, a, in about 100 meters of water but in order not to be driven off off, off its location if it's, it's anchored but if it's, if it's pushed off site, then the drill string breaks and uh, you have to, you, the potential of, a, of, a, of an oil blowout. Uh, so to keep it safe, you have to con constantly circle it with an icebreaker, breaking up the ice around it so that the ice pressure doesn't build up. Now that obviously is easier if the ice is thin, and it's easier still if there isn't any ice there at all. So oil exploration is will become easier, as has already become easier, in the coastal seas of the Arctic. Um, there's, it's, it's more dangerous also to, to live in the Arctic or to, to, to work and operate in the Arctic. And this even applies to, to the local people. These are Inuit hunters at Karnak, which is in northwest Greenland, and we went out with them um, because uh, we were fixing radar systems to their sledges. They've got wooden sledges, and they were beginning to find that they were having accidents where they, were the, uh, they ran over a very thin piece of ice, which you couldn't see because of the snow, and they'd fall through, and that could be fatal. So to protect them, and also to supply information to us on how the ice thickness is changing, they would put a radar... Uh, on the bottom of, of the sledge, which gives them a readout so they can see how thick the ice is, but also transmits data by satellite to, to our lab, and we, can, we get a record of the ice thickness in the whole operating area of those hunters, uh, which is the fjords of northwest Greenland. Um, now, that, that's so, so the, the feedbacks that result from the thinning, here, here are some of them, and that which I'm going to talk about. Um, the, first of all, the, the retreats uh, accelerated because of the thinning. The, the albedo feedback, which I've mentioned, uh, the, the fact that the Greenland ice sheet is melting faster because of warm winds blowing over it, and that increases the rate of global sea level rise. The next thing I'm going to mention is, is snow line retreat, and then I'll talk about Arctic methane and, and then food production 
and its relationship to extreme weather events. And then the decline in strength of the thermohaline circulation, which is related to increased intensity of hurricanes. Uh, so these are global effects. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's... Um, Okay, I've already talked about this um, question of uh, albedo change and, and that it's, it's, it's making the, the, the global climate warm up faster. The, the change due to the retreat of the ice makes the climate warm up 25% faster than it would do if there were no change in ice extent. And that's global climate, 25% increase. But the people who did that study failed to consider the snow line retreat. What's happening is, is as, the, as the area around the Arctic Ocean becomes ice free, then the, the land masses all around the Arctic, that's northern Siberia, uh, Alaska, northern Canada, they also become snow free earlier in the summer. So in June, for instance, in June 2012, this whole brown area uh, was a re region that normally would be snow covered still in June, but in fact were snow free. And it's when it's snow free you have open, you have tundra, forest, um, which is dark. So the change in albedo of the surface from snow to forest or tundra is the same as the, the, de the change in albedo from sea ice to open water. So it's as if this whole area used to be ice covered and is now water covered. And so that has the magnitude of that anomaly uh, is about six million square kilometers, which is huge. Um, we, we've got six million square kilometers less uh, snow area in the Northern Hemisphere now than in the 1970s. And uh, that six million square kilometers is as great as the decrease in the sea ice cover. So essentially, we're dumping the same amount of albedo change again on the planet from the retreat of snow as we had from the retreat of ice. So instead of 25% increase, we're getting a 50% increase. So in other words, the, the, uh, these, these, change, these global changes that are produced by the retreat of ice give us an acceleration of warming uh, as if we were putting 50% more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than we actually are. So you put, you put two molecules of CO2 into the atmosphere, you get one free, but that, that one free makes things worse. So that's, that's a quite a serious effect, this acceleration of global warming because of the albedo change with applying it to snow as well as to ice. Uh, now, the next thing I'll look at is the Atlantic thermohaline circulation, which was called uh, by... Um, uh, a scientist at, at uh, Le Mont, the Great Conveyor Belt, which is an easier way of thinking about it than this uh, the Atlantic thermohaline circulation. And um, the way that works is that uh, most we're used to thinking about all the currents of the world as being mainly wind-driven. So the Gulf Stream is driven by the wind, the Antarctic circumpolar currents driven by the wind. We have wind-driven currents that are the most powerful currents in the ocean. But on top of that, we have a very slow circulation in the ocean, uh, which is not driven by wind directly, but it's driven by the fact that in certain parts of the ocean, you have a lot of rainfall uh, that dilutes the ocean surface, and makes the water less saline. In other parts of the ocean where it's very hot, like in the, around the equator, you have a lot of evaporation and not much rainfall and the water becomes more saline. Uh, so that's the sort of haline part of the thermohaline circulation, that, that there's parts of the ocean which get um, saltier and parts of the ocean which get less salty, depending on the balance between rainfall and uh, sunshine. And then the thermo part is that, again, water that's flowing near the equator is warmed up by the sun, water that's flowing in, in high latitudes is not. So the, the circulation is because the water itself changes its properties as it, uh, as it survives near the surface with, due to either rainfall, sunshine on it and, and heating. Um, and so 
the, the imbalance between these drives a slow circulation and this is called the, the great global conveyor belt um, and it ha it, if we look at it this is a, a very simplified map of it uh, which, uh, which is uh, Okay, it doesn't have the curse that it did, but uh, it, it's, it's very slow. Uh, that is to say, it takes about a thousand years for a little particle of water to make a complete circuit of the planet in this circulation. So it's, it is very slow. But if we look at the, the North Atlantic part of this circulation, we see the thick brown line is, is the same as the Gulf Stream. It's the same direction of the Gulf Stream. It's carrying water from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, southeastern part of the US across the Atlantic and then up the, the coast of northern northwest Europe and then it sinks in, in a place where we which I've been studying uh, northwest northeast of Greenland or east of Greenland uh, where I got that little label and then the water that's having sunk there uh, goes uh, along the seabed as a deep current and that's the light colored uh, arrow it goes southwards um, down the Atlantic in, into some complicated system in the Antarctic it flows eastwards across the the South Indian Ocean and then it flows northwards again and surfaces or, or upwells in the North Pacific and becomes a surface current that's the brown which flows all the way backwards at the surface and rejoins where it started in off um, uh, eastern parts of the US. And there's another bit that continues around the Antarctic. So it's like a conveyor belt, and the, a conveyor belt has, has to have two um, ratchets or two, two fly pulleys at each end for it to be a conveyor belt. And the pulleys, which mean that water comes in at the surface and goes out at depth or comes in at depth and comes out at the surface that one of the, the most important conveyor belts as far as part of the conveyor belts as far as we're concerned in Europe and in the US is the one in the northern North Atlantic um, this, uh, there we are um, okay <clears throat> so w if we focus on the, the Atlantic part of the circulation, we've got the brown line, which is surface flow across the Atlantic and northwards, mimicking the, the flow of the Gulf Stream. And then it, the water sinks and flows southwards um, at great depth. So how does that happen? Well, uh, firstly, the effects of that are, are very important because it makes Europe um, the Gulf Stream and the, North, and the thermal hairline circulation together make Europe much warmer than it ought to be. Uh, this is the temperature differences between uh, different uh, parts of the world in terms of their latitude. So uh, Northwest Europe is between 5 and 10 degrees warmer than it ought to be for its latitude, while uh, Eastern Canada uh, and Greenland, of course, are several degrees colder and so we know that that's the case because from from Scotland for instance you look due west you get to Labrador and Scotland's quite a warm country but Labrador is quite a cold country so um, what's happening is this warm current flowing up the Atlantic from the Gulf of Mexico uh, which the thermal haline the conveyor belt plus the Gulf Stream together wash the shores of Europe make it much warmer than it ought to be that also explains why Norway for instance is hasn't got any sea ice around it anyway that's that's the what it does which so it's quite has quite a big climate effect and um, how is it how does this sinking happen and because you can't have a conveyor belt without two pulleys to drive it and the pulley in the north of the Atlantic we've we studied it for several years and it's it's a very interesting one because it happens in this little area in off East Greenland called the Odden Ice Tongue um, that here the the uh, Greenland is on the left and Spitsbergen's on at the top and 
The, 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 the East Greenland current, which carries ice out of the Arctic, flows down the east coast of Greenland, that's the red ice. But there's a current called the Jan Mayen Polar Current that, that diverts out to the eastward. It, it comes out away from the Greenland coast because there's a ridge that sits there diverting it. It's called the Jan Mayen Ridge. And the island of Jan Mayen is on that ridge. So there's, there's cold water coming out of the Greenland coast, flowing out into the open Greenland Sea. And that cold water, of course, develops an ice cover in winter. So this is a kind of tongue-shaped ice cover. It's growing there because of the cold water that's flowing out of Greenland. And the Norwegians call it the Odden, which means tongue. And the, 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 the open water to the left of it, to the west of it, is called Nordbukta, Northern Bight. So this ice that's growing here is not like ordinary sea ice. It's not a continuous sheet because there's so much wave action around because it's such a rough ocean, the, the Greenland Sea, that the ice forms in very small cakes. And that's a, the picture at the bottom there is, is what that ice looks like. It's called pancake ice because it looks like pancakes. You, the ice is forming as a kind of suspension. It, they, they, they form small cakes that are about two or three metres across, which are continually colliding, so they get raised edges. So they look just like pancakes. Um, and they can't, they can't freeze together to form a sheet because there's too much wave action. But these pancakes can grow very fast. And we've been stu we were studying the pancakes and the water underneath. So here's, here's some work we were doing with the pancakes. Um, we will be measuring the, 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 the currents, the, how, the, how they flowed with a drifting buoy. And um, the bottom, we had a, a pancake lifter, uh, the, which we were working from a Norwegian research ship, which is mainly crewed by fishermen. So the fishermen were absolutely amazed that his, these scientists getting paid to, to to catch ice. <laughs> so they, they, they were thought, well, this must be a real racket uh, when they have to really work hard and catch fish. Here we are just lifting up ice. But lifting the pancakes up onto the ship, we then cut them up and we could see how much salt there was in them and uh, therefore what effect they were having on the ocean as they grew. So uh, we were doing a serious job there. Um, and I keep... Uh, uh, so what happens is the pancakes grow very fast um, and when they grow, uh, the ice, the, the, the salt that's in the ocean, a lot of it doesn't go into the pancake because sea ice doesn't have a very high salinity. Not, not much of the ice from, not much of the water, uh, when, when water freezes, not, not much of the salt goes into the pancakes. So the pancakes are rejecting salt. The salt goes into the water that the salt makes the water more dense and the water sinks because it's close to a instability. And so what we found when we were working around there was these things called chimneys, which were only found in this area of the world. It's, it's just a unique part of the world ocean. And uh, they're, they're called chimneys because they're like chimneys. Um, you've got, there we are, here, 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 this is a, uh, a map, um, a, te a salinity and a temperature, the salinity, temperature and density. It, it, they're cross sections across the ocean. What we do is stop the ship, do a lower uh, an instrument called a CTD that measures temperature and, and salinity. Move a couple of miles, do it again, and move a couple of miles, do it again. Painfully slowly you build up a picture of the structure of the water. And here um, we've got cold water right at the surface going down a huge, to a huge depth. It's going down to 2,500 metres and it's all surface water. So if you're sitting at the surface with a, a parcel of water at, at the ocean surface, it sinks because of all the extra salt given to it by the pancakes and it sinks down 2,500 metres. And then when it reaches the bottom of that, it flows outwards and head southward. So that's the, that's the, um, the vertical pulley that, that's part of the, the pulley of the thermal hairline circulation are these chimneys. And uh, 
the, there's, uh, it's very slow business to investigate these chimneys. Um, they, they're very long lasting. They, we, we, we will go back, uh, we went back every winter for three years and the same chimneys were there. So the chimney survives from year to year and nobody knows why because usually something like that, a small feature in the ocean will dissipate and, and you don't get small features in the ocean lasting very long. But in this case, there's something about the, the way in which the chimney forms that enables it to last a long time and do its job of sink, causing water to sink and keeping the driver going on the thermal hairline circulation. So these chimneys are remarkable things. The first, and in fact, this is a, a perspective view of a chimney and I sort of made it look like a chimney by doing it in red <laughs> and making it shiny so it looks like a chimney pot. But that is the, the contour of the minus, uh, minus 0.9 degree contour of temperature. And it's going down through some warmer water, which is shown in yellow. So these, these are extraordinary features, and they're very narrow. They're only 20 kilometers across. And that's, that's very small for a feature in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so we, we studied that for a long time. And um, then uh, something happened. That is, the, the odd and ice tongue disappeared. Um, you depend on the ice formation in that, that pancake ice. It has to happen in order for the, uh, the water to gain density from, from the salt that, that uh, is rejected by the pancakes. But if you don't have an odd and ice tongue, which we haven't had since 1998, um, then you don't get uh, uh, chimneys forming because there's, there isn't any pancake ice to supply the, the extra density. So we've now lost the whole field of chimneys. We've lost the, the pulley uh, in, the, in the thermal hairline circulation, and we're not getting chimneys anymore. And it means that the, the thermal hairline circulation is getting weaker, and uh, it's, it's already declined by at least 20% uh, since in, in the last 20 years. So that has um, really serious implications. There was a, a really terrible film made uh, a few years back on the based on this, this theory, and that was called The Day After Tomorrow. So I don't know if you remember what, watching it. It was really, it, it made you cringe to look at it, but it, it had a sudden change in the, in, the, in the climate, which was detected by a Scottish oceanographer, I don't know who he was meant to be, uh, and who warned the world, but they didn't pay any attention. And uh, the, the change in the circulation meant that suddenly, uh, New York and, and the whole east coast of the US became bitterly cold and frozen and horrible consequences. Um, now the thing is, um, with, with this weakening of the thermal hairline circulation, you will get a cooling. Um, and it, the trouble is it will take several decades to happen and not rather than two days. Um, but the, so the, the, the film wasn't 100% wrong, it was only about 99% bomb. Um, so the, what would happen with, with this thermal hairline circulation weakening, um, because you're not getting a, a, a pulley anymore, you're not getting the ice tongue, uh, one of the things is that, that you'll get a weakening of the surface current coming up from Gulf of Mexico towards Northwest Europe. So that current is made up of a mixture of the Gulf Stream and the thermal hairline circulation. You've still got the Gulf Stream, because that's driven by the wind, but the thermal circulation is weakening, and the models that predict what that will do to climate are, this is one produced by the European Environment Agency, and what it predicts is that, uh, with business as usual, most of Europe, by 2100, will have a warming of about four degrees. And that's a that's very, very serious result, because it means, for instance, that Italy, my favourite country where I now work, will become a desert, basically, with four degrees of warming. You're changing that into the climate of North Africa. And the same with Spain. And um, it, it's very, very serious for... Well, four degrees is very serious for the whole world. But Britain, 
uh, gains out of all this because we're stuck out in the Atlantic and we're only going to get two degrees of warming. And same with Ireland and parts of the west coast of Norway and France, west, and that the Atlantic coast of France uh, and Iceland. Because these are all stuck out in the Atlantic, the, the flow is less, the water is cooler um, by the time it gets up to these latitudes, and that means that uh, the, you're not getting as much warming. So it doesn't turn, into a, doesn't turn into ice like New York would in the film, but it does warm up more slowly. So the prediction is that by the end of the century, uh, Europe will be really suffering from, from global warming, but Britain and Ireland and Iceland will be in a better state. Uh, so however little they deserve it, but anyway, that's that. That's what will happen. Um, so um, that's the predictions. But if we look at the other end, we're getting less flow in, in the Gulf Stream coming from the thermohaline circulation. So you're, you're transmitting less water and less heat uh, from, from the, the Gulf region up to northern Europe. That means more of that heat stays down in the Gulf region. And that means more rapid warming of the surface water in the Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, the, the tropical Atlantic. And that means more intense hurricanes. So the, 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 the gain that, that Britain and Northwest Europe have from the, uh, from the loss of the thermohaline circulation is, is reflected in a loss for the people of, of southern part of the states and, and um, the Caribbean because um, hurricanes are going to be more intense. It, it doesn't really say anything about how many hurricanes will be, but each hurricane is going to have a greater intensity because the sea surface temperature is greater and it's the sea surface temperature is warming up faster than you'd expect because you're getting a weakening of the current that takes the heat away. So there's a, there's a nasty climate result for the world, or, or for, for the Gulf of Mexico anyway. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's the threat from the thermohaline circulation, which is a gain for no Western Europe, uh, a loss for the Gulf of Mexico region and, and southern states. Um, the next threat is, that comes from this loss of ice which I think is the worst one, or, or potentially the worst, is the threat from offshore methane. Um, I say it in words here, so I'll, but I'll go straight through into the pictures. Um, and that comes about because the, if you look at the Arctic Ocean, it's very... Um, it's, a, it's an ocean, it, but it's an ocean that's different from others. Most, most oceans are four to 5,000 metres deep. And the Arctic is in the middle, that's uh, the central Arctic basin is four to five thousand meters, but the Arctic also has the widest continental shelves of any uh, part of the world, and we can see the Barents Sea, the Kara Sea, the Laptev Sea, and the East Siberian Sea. All these seas north of Russia are very wide and they're very shallow. They're only fifty to hundred meters deep, so really there's a very very steep cliff at the edge of this shallow water going down from 50 metres to 4,000 metres. So a 12,000 foot high cliff runs all the way round the edge of the Arctic. Uh, now, as the ice retreats in summer, it's still there in the centre of the Arctic Ocean. It hasn't, we haven't had an ice-free September yet, but we do regularly get a summer in which the ice retreats from all these shelf seas. So these seas, which used to be ice covered even in summer, are now ice-free in summer for three, four months in a year. So that has lots of consequences. One, one is that you can run ships uh, across from Europe to uh, Japan through the northern sea route and not hit ice. Uh, but the other one is that this water warms up um, because you've got 50 to 100 metres of water depth. You've got a lot of radiation, 24 hours a day of sunshine in, uh, in summer. Um, uh, 20, or daylight anyway, and uh, the water warms up. Uh, you haven't got any sea ice to protect 
the ocean from, from warming. So you can get temperatures which are quite high. Uh, and when I was up there recently, we found temperatures of 11 degrees in one, at one spot. And that, that's, that's really warm. That's like temperatures that you swim in, in off Britain <laughs> and the North Sea. Uh, and I'll try and, try and get it to... Uh, here we are. Um, this is uh, some, some data from satellites, and this is from 2007. Uh, the, the blue line is where the Ice Edge was in 2007, in, in September, and the, the, the colours are surface water temperatures, and we can see that uh, there's some water that was more than 5 degrees, that's the brown stuff there, and a lot of water was more than 3 degrees. So that water would have been less than zero degrees in a normal winter. But in the last few years, as the ice has retreated, it's warmed up. So one consequence of sea ice retreat in summer is warming of the coastal seas. And the warming of the coastal seas is a pretty serious problem because um, at the, on the seabed you have this layer of permafrost which has been around since the last ice age, and that sits on top of several hundred metres of sediment which are full of methane. So the methane would like to come out, as, but there's a pressure, the pressure of the permafrost on top stops the methane from escaping, so it's like a, it's like a, um, a pressure cooker. And um, once, the me once the surface permafrost melts, the methane can come out, out of the seabed, bubble up to the surface and get out into the atmosphere and cause uh, a rapid and sudden global warming. So we've got data now from, from buoys that we, that we install near the seabed and show this warming happening. The temperatures on the seabed reach 3 degrees C. Um, and then we... Uh, um, Sorry for the delays, it seems to take a while. He, okay, he, here's the stuff um, that, that is the, the causing the damage, the, 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 evil, the evil stuff here is, is a me methane hydrates. The methane that's under the, under the sediments that's being held back from coming out is actually not in the form of a gas, it's in the form of a solid material in which is actually ice but the ice has a different structure. It's like a kind of cage. So you have ice, crisp, ice molecules forming a cage, and the holes in the cage contain methane molecules. So that thing you see there that looks like a, a piece of ice is actually a piece of ice plus methane. The methane is, is, is contained within the structure of the ice. So this, uh, this was dredged up. Uh, the thing about it is it's, it's called, it's really ice which burns. And there's some very nice pictures. I didn't take one myself. But if you, if you put, a, uh, if you put a, a, a flame against this, it burns. There's enough methane in that piece of ice to cause it to burn. So you've got a, a lump of ice which is burning, which looks pretty eerie. Anyway, that's, that's where the methane is. It's in these, the form of these methane hydrates. And, um, and it's already happening that um, in places the, the seabed has melted, the permafrost has thawed, and methane's coming off. So this is a picture taken in the East Siberian Sea by sonar. We're looking out from, from uh, a vehicle, an underwater vehicle, which is uh, pinging on sideways. And each of these is a plume of methane coming away from the seabed. So the seabed's 60 to 70 metres down, and each of these is, is a, a plume of methane gas coming out from the seabed. And altogether, that plume is about a kilometre across, and it's, it's bubbling up. So if, you, if you're on the surface with a ship, you have to be really careful not to have any naked flames, because otherwise you could have an explosion. But this is pretty frightening. It never used to happen because in summer, there wasn't any open water. And, and so the, the fact there was an ice cover there kept the water cold and you didn't have any methane being emitted. But now you do, 
and every year there's more methane being emitted, more and more bubble plumes coming out, and that methane reaches the surface, comes out into the atmosphere and causes global warming. And this is some, a photo taken from that vehicle of methane bubbles coming up, and you can see how intense that plume is. And, um, oops, um, okay. Okay, and then this is the, uh, when there was, there was some, some ice drifted in, and here's the methane bubbles are flattening themselves against the ice on the top, so you've got flattened bubbles. Um, then you can see the, the fact that there's more methane in the atmosphere from satellites, because there are instruments on, on satellites which can measure methane concentration. And uh, here, uh, as a colleague of ours uh, in the uh, University of Maryland who, who, who works on this, and the left-hand picture is uh, methane concentrations in the atmosphere in 2008, and the right-hand picture is 2011. Of course, the right-hand picture's got more red in it, <laughs> and I should have shown the scale, so it doesn't, but it does mean there's more methane in the Arctic atmosphere in 2011 because there's more of these plumes coming up. So that's really pretty worrying. Um, and it seems to, okay. Here's another one of methane. This is looking from the ship. And there's a very thin ice cover, which you can't really see, but it's still enough for the methane bubbles to flatten themselves against the ice before they break through. So you see these flat mushroom-shaped things, which are methane bubbles sitting underneath a transparent ice cover. Um, so then this is the compendium of all the data from these satellites, which shows that the whole northern hemisphere has a higher methane concentration than the southern hemisphere. Now, the, the sources of methane in the world are, there's a lot of them, and some of them are natural, and some of them are unnatural. Um, the, the natural ones include termites, which produce methane when they're doing their thing in there. Um, but a very big source of methane is uh, animal husbandry. And, and, uh, and this is obviously something you're very concerned about in this meeting, but uh, if, you, if you have a large number of domestic animals and, and the number increases all the time, like it does in China now, then the, the, those animals are producing methane at a rapid rate, and um, it's a significant contributor to the total methane output uh, of the, into the planet, into the atmosphere. So that's a big contributor. And um, another one that's of unknown size, because nobody admits to what it, what it actually is, is methane re released from leaks in, in, pi in gas pipelines and from leaks in fracking operations. Like the Russians uh, used to have uh, gas pipelines coming from the Arctic across the tundra where they would lay six pipelines in parallel without any kind of support. They'd just be lying on the tundra. And then as the tundra melted, uh, or there was some upheaval, uh, some pipelines would break. And they wouldn't bother because if they have six pipelines and two of them break, they've still got four pipelines transmitting the gas. But the fact that the other two are leaking gas into the atmosphere was something they wouldn't bother with. They do now because they realise how valuable the gas is. But in the past, there was a lot of leakage from gas pipelines, most of them Russian. And now there's leaking, leakage from fracking, fracking operations, which again is not admitted to. So we've got methane going into the atmosphere from man's technical operations, methane going into the atmosphere from man's uh, animal husbandry operations, and m going into the atmosphere from a few natural sources, but now we add to that methane coming up from the seabed and being emitted to the atmosphere around the Arctic coastlines. And this is what, what, by tracing back the sources here, it looks as if this distribution map looks as if the origin of a lot of that methane is 
high latitudes in, in the north. So the, 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 that may be the contributor why you have more methane in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. There's other reasons, but it looks as if the, uh, the Arctic methane threat is becoming real. Um, now, we, we've been working with these, the Russians who've been doing this work, and one of them predicted uh, that there would be 50 gigatons of methane could come out in a single pulse uh, by calculating how fast the permafrost is, is melting. Um, she predicted that you, you could get within a, a year or two of emission, uh, 50 gigatons coming out, which is, uh, sounds like a huge figure, that it is, but it's, it's only about less than 10% of the amount of methane that's sitting there in the sediments. So uh, it's quite a conservative estimate, only 10% of the methane being emitted. But we did a study of what that would do to climate if it all comes out in... in um, in this case, we allowed it 10 years to come out. So we, uh, so we published a paper in Nature which caused a huge amount of controversy and we, we were told that we were alarmist. And, um, uh, but in fact, um, people now are kind of agreeing that this could happen. And um, here's the, the blue here is, that I shouldn't have put the thing on the background, but. The blue line here is the warming of the world in the next 80 years on a business as usual uh, estimate. Uh, that gives you to about four degrees of warming. The red line is, is, the different, is what happens if you have a methane outbreak uh, of 50 gigatons, and it almost immediately gives you 0.6 of a degree of extra warming, and that persists, gradually fades away process to the end of the century. And these, these other lines are, if we, if we do other things, that have a big emissions or small emissions. But the difference between the blue and the red is the methane pulse. And that's giving us 0.6 of a degree, which, if it's, if it's applied suddenly, would have enormously bad effects on the world. I mean, it, it's a, uh, well, nobody's really thought what it would do, but but we, we did a study uh, using one of the, the my fellow authors did used the economic model that was developed um, for the Stern Review, which was a, a British government review of effects of global warming. And um, they used various models for economic impacts. And the conclusion was if you have a 50 gigatons methane pulse, not only will it give you 0.6 of a degree of warming, but the total cost to the world of all the harmful effects of that will be $60 trillion. So we put that in the paper, and, and general sort of fear and terror of, about that. And, and uh, we, I guess we, we should have been more cautious, but in fact, that's what, that's what the model came out with, that uh, you, 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 you're adding $60 trillion, which itself is only about 15% of the economic cost of global warming, so it's a, it's it's only adding 15% to the the horror that we're already facing. Um, and the the thing is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tends to ignore this this threat, but they don't ignore an equally bad threat, which is that um, the permafrost on land is also thawing um, over a huge area. That's the whole of northern Asia. And it's, it's thawing more slowly than this offshore permafrost, but it's still thawing slowly. And the total amount of methane that will be released this century from that is about the same as the total amount of methane that will be released in a single burst. So even if we don't get a quick burst, which does us in, um, we'll get a slow methane emission, which will, will cause the same in the long term, the same effect. And we can see that happening wherever we do measurements. Um, this is some measurements of permafrost at Dead Horse, Alaska, which is near Prudhoe Bay. And we can see how rapidly the, the, the frozen soil warms up. Wherever you look, you're seeing warming of permafrost, melting of permafrost, 
buildings collapsing because they're built on permafrost. So we'll get the methane, whether we like it or not, whether, whether we do something about the offshore Arctic, whether we can do, it, can do anything, or whether we simply, we're lucky and we don't, get a, we don't get an outbreak from offshore, we'll still get the methane from, from the land, the decay on land. OK, so that's, uh, that's methane. Um, then uh, come on to weather. And the link between weather extremes and um, uh, ice is, is slightly, uh, slightly more dubious. Um, it, it's, I think it's, it's quite strong. Uh, but um, but the, the, um, a lot of scientists say it's unproven. Uh, the person who's done the most, uh, in fact, on this and thinks it is due to ice is Jennifer Hutchings at uh, Rutgers University. So she was a colleague of the lady last night in that, the panel. Um, and the way it, it works uh, is, is this, uh, that, here we are, um, that it's, it's all due to the, the jet stream. So what happens is... Uh, the jet stream is the, is the fast-flowing, narrow, fast-flowing air mass that, that separates the, the polar air over the Arctic from tropical air masses. So it's, it's a boundary between two air masses. Now, because the Arctic's warming faster than the tropical uh, latitudes, the, the temperature difference between the Arctic and the tropics is going down. It's, there's less of a temperature contrast between the Arctic and, and the tropics. So this, this boundary, uh, the wind in this boundary are less, become less strong. The jet stream weakens. And the jet stream normally, or used to be, more or less a straight line. If you, if you were in it, it meant it was a fast flight from North America to Europe and a slow flight from Europe to North America. Um, so it, made, it makes a difference. To, it can be up to 200 miles an hour. But uh, it, was, it was more or less a straight line. But as it slowed down because of this uh, warming of the Arctic, then it became, uh, it became bendy. It, it, it broke up into these lobes where instead of being a straight line, it's, and typically that, that often happens when a, uh, a current weakens. It, it, it um, develops eddies. So this, this has developed these lobes, and the lobes are quite stable. They sit there like this, and you can see that uh, here, um, if we look at the Pacific Northwest, you've got polar air coming down to a lower latitude than it ought to be, so you're getting very much colder conditions in the Pacific Northwest than you, you will get in an average year. Uh, over in, in the Midwest here, you also you're getting much warmer conditions because the, the tropical air is reaching up to higher latitudes than it should be. In the northeast, you're getting colder conditions because the, the polar air is coming down to a lower latitude. So all around the world, you're having alternating zones of extremely warm weather and extremely cold weather. And sometimes the extremes are so extreme that they break records. So that's why we talk about weather extremes and it's only been happening for the last seven or eight years, which happens to coincide to, with the period when the, the sea ice has been retreating so much in the Arctic. So um, it looks as if, according to Jennifer, that, that the retreat of sea ice and the warming of the Arctic is causing the jet stream to slow down. It's developing these big lobes. The lobes are fairly stable. They only drift around slowly, and they result in extremely warm air being in places where it shouldn't be and extremely cold air being in places where it shouldn't be. So the net effect is it's not a warming or a cooling. Uh, although um, although our climatic expert, uh, Donald Trump, said <laughs> on a cold day, let's have some more of that global warming, um, indicating that in his expert view, um, the, the, the cold air outbreak in, in north, the northeast was not due to this, but due to something else. Um, and uh, anyway, th this is what happens. And, 
and we do find these extremes happening and, and they, they produce record cold or record heat. Um, so that's, that's what, what a lot of scientists think are happening, is happening, and, um, and so, or something like, something like it is going on. And the result is, unfortunately, that the, where the, all these lobes are happening, the, the north uh, in, in latitudes where it shouldn't be, uh, happens to unfortunately be in the zone of the maximum crop production on the planet. So the, 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 the north, the, the extreme anomalies of, of heat versus cold, you're finding in North America, in just the latitudes where grain is grown, same in Europe, and across into uh, the, the Urals and the, the um, steppes of Asia and East Asia. These are all, unfortunately, the mid-northern latitudes, and those are the latitudes where the maximum amount of, of food is grown. So we can't... Um, the, the, the jet stream anomalies that are producing this, these extremes are hitting us right where it hurts food production the most. And um, it's already started to happen, and it seemed to happen, start to happen at the beginning of this century, just like the retreat of Arctic sea ice. And uh, last night, several people in the panel and questions from the floor were concerned with uh, Syria and other Mideastern countries. Was the, the unrest and, and the warfare there related to hunger? lack of food and it does look as if that would fit this this climate extreme um, business because um, in 2000 the food and agricultural organization produced a world food index which is the average cost of food for the average person in the world so it's you know, it's an extremely complex thing to work out it's it's you're looking at how everybody in the world eats and what the cost of their food is and it started at 100 in 2000, and, and th this is what it then did. By 2008, it had gone up to 220, and then it went down, and it's, it went up again to more than to 240 in 2011. And curiously enough, we, we haven't got any statistics after that, and uh, it's not clear whether the the FAO stopped producing them or produced them but didn't publish them. So we don't know what's happened to the World Food Price Index in, in recent years. But you can see that um, in those years we can, we can tag the, the years of highest food prices with various revolutions, civil wars, unrest in, in countries of the third world. And you see, uh, when it reached its peak, that was the Arab Spring, original Arab Spring, the Tunisian revolt. And that w arose directly from food prices. The people in Tunis were saying, we can't afford to eat. And what makes that worse is the population growth in the cities of the third world. You're, you've got a huge number of young people, young men mainly, um, living in, in cities. They can't grow anything because they're not... They're not traditional farmers. They, they, they're, 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 they're being born in huge numbers, living in, the, in a city, haven't got any way of earning a living, or very difficult to earn a living. And if the food is expensive, which they have to buy, they can't grow, then they're really in trouble. So the food price index hits the, the population of third world cities very badly, especially young people. And they, young people are the ones who tend to riot and revolt. So you can see what, how easily a, a rise in a doubling of food prices, which happened um, up in 2008, would give you uh, riots and warfare. And then the fact that things went quiet again when the food prices went down and then erupted again in 2011 when they went up again to even higher values, it seems to be a very strong correlation between um, global food prices and uh, warfare in cities in the third world, especially 
the Middle East and North Africa. And, well, and you can see Africa in general as well, but a lot of it is in Arab countries. So you see there's a, there's a link, and the 2008 and 2011 corresponded to um, extreme stable lobes in the, go in the jet stream and extremes of, of weather. So the extremes, that, so the, the story, if it, it's not 100% linked, but the sea ice retreat and the, the associated warming of the Arctic leads to um, a slower jet stream, which leads to lobes in the jet stream, which leads to extreme warm and cold events, which leads to more expensive food, uh, loss of food production in mid-latitudes, um, uh, more expensive food, and that leads to riots and war. So it's a, it's a pretty nasty set of, of causal linkages. And um, if, if, that, if all of those links are valid, then that's, that's very bad. We're in a very bad state because this can only get worse. Um, I'll show you how it can get worse. And again, I mentioned this yesterday because I couldn't really believe it, but it is true. It's a projection by the uh, UN um, World Pop uh, They've got a, a World Population Prospects. It's a report by the UN in 2015 giving the current and projected populations of different regions of the world between 2015 and 2100. So, um, this came out wrong, uh, but North America, for instance, in 2015 had 358 million people. In 2100, it's projected to have 500 million. South America, uh, 634 to 721. So North America and South America are growing in population, but relatively slowly. Europe actually decreases in population, according to this projection, because uh, uh, it's getting to be a, an old continent and people aren't having so many children. Um, Asia is growing, but not that fast. Oceania is growing. But you see the, the biggest f f growth and the almost unbelievable figure is Africa, which is grows from 1186, 1, million, 1 billion, 186 million today, to 4.387 billion by the end of the century. Now, uh, that's, that's a quadrupling of the population in a, a continent which can't feed itself now and uh, it already is dependent on, on overseas aid whenever there's a famine or even without a famine and also huge numbers of people are trying to leave Africa all the time that's, that's this, um, paying to be put, put onto boats that drift across the Mediterranean and sink there's a huge pressure to get out of Africa um, because of the, the fact it offers no future for young people um, and, and offers potential famine and starvation. And these numbers are just so huge. They can't, in a, in a sense, they can't be credible because if Africa can't feed itself now, if it has four times as many people, it obviously won't be able to feed itself and it won't be able to get the food aid it needs from the rest of the world because the rest of the world will also be in trouble and countries that traditionally supply a lot of food aid like the uh, United States might not be in a position to do so. So you would have real famine and starvation. So there's, there's, the population clearly can't reach four billion. Something will happen and, and whatever happens will be very, very nasty. But most the rest of the world can avoid that on the whole with, with sort of improvements in agriculture. Uh, these relatively modest, and they're not modest, they're, they're quite high, but, but rel compared to Africa, these modest increases in population can maybe be, be uh, uh, fed and, and taken care of. But, but Africa, that can't be the case. So, there's a, a, an awful thing happening in Africa, according to this UN report. Um, and uh, just at a time when, when the, the uh, food supply is threatened. I mean, the, the, the Green Revolution did give you 
uh, uh, an increase in food production that stayed ahead of population. But uh, if we have um, global warming uh, at the level that we, we fear we're going to have, then independent of these weather extremes, we're going to have a reduced yields for all the, the standard crops that, that uh, we use at the moment. And uh, this is some estimates of how the yield changes as the global temperature rises from pre-industrial level. So it's already one degree above pre-industrial level. So uh, we can see that uh, there's uh, wheat, temperate wheat, according to this, um, continues to give a greater yield up to, up to one and a half degrees of warming. Then it starts going down. Um, everything else it, uh, is already going down at one degree. And, um, and then the rate of decrease of yield increases quite fast as we get up to, to four degrees, which is what everybody's expecting the Earth to be warmed up by by the end of the century in reality. So you're going to have big decreases in percentage yields of major crops, um, corresponding just to already uh, what, we, uh, what we're getting from the disruption of crops due to weather extremes in the northern hemisphere. Um, so the, uh, the question is, what can we do about all this? <laughs> and um, the, in terms of, of food, the, it, it's very hard to see how we can get out of the, the mess we're in um, quickly. I mean, in the long run, one can see changing the way people eat and what they eat is very important. But in the short run, there's the Green Revolution, which kept people fed, has sort of run its course. We're getting um, warming, which we're trying to keep down to 20, to, say to 1.5 or 2 degrees, because if, we, if warming goes beyond 2 degrees, we see this big drop off of plant yields, um, crop yields. We're getting extra disruption due to climate extreme, weather extremes, which become climate extremes if they go on every year in the mid-northern mid latitudes. So we're really uh, up the creek as far as uh, food production in relation to population. And we're getting this population explosion, which nobody's doing anything about, uh, especially in Africa, with this quadrupling of the population um, at a time when the, the continent can't feed itself. So all of those things point to gruesome consequences. So to, 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 on a happier note, <laughs> what do, can we do? And I think there are things we can do uh, in the short term. And uh, what, we, what we need to do, I think, is, is develop as a major commitment for the planet, uh, as a Manhattan Project thing, um, a way of economically taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it seems at first as if one shouldn't go for that because since it's, it's technology that's got us into this mess, if we try and do a technical fix for it, we'll probably make things worse, which could be true. But on the other hand, I don't see any other way of getting us out of this, the terrible consequences of, of global warming being becoming as rapid as it is. Uh, so uh, I'm pushing for, well, I hope there's other people pushing as well, for direct air capture, which is where you, you pump uh, air through, through uh, over, over catalysts or over chemicals which absorb CO2. You then um, uh, liquefy the CO2, put it underground, or do something to it, turn it into some other material. And, and then continue the pumping. Um, so this will be a massive task. Um, and you sort of think, well, we can save ourselves by something yet to be invented. That sounds a bit kind of uh, uh, ridiculous. But in fact, it has been invented that techniques that work have been developed by at least five different groups and pilot plants have been built. This year, 
a pilot plant was built in Iceland using geothermal power to remove carbon dioxide from the air and pump it down into uh, subterranean rocks where it, it reacts chemically with the rock. And that's a small plant, but it's working. It was a Swiss company did that. There's three US companies with different methods that they would want to try out. And so it, all of them have got methods which work, but which are too expensive. The, the, the break-even point is reckoned to be $40 per tonne because that's the estimate of what uh, CO2 release, the cost of it for the planet. It's an arbitrary figure, but somebody came up with it and it's now regarded as holy writ. So if you can, if you can get rid of CO2 at less than $40 a tonne, it's a gain, so you should do it. Um, now, uh, the trouble is that the, the companies that have developed methods, at the moment they cost about $100 a tonne, and that's very, very promising because if we look at solar energy, for instance, uh, solar photovoltaic power, that costs about 1% of what it cost 10 years ago because of so much money was spent on developing solar that it's made it very cheap. It's made it cheaper than fossil fuels. So we could, if we spent enough money, we could do the same with these methods. We could get them cheaper so that they're less than $40 a tonne. So I think we can develop direct air capture that will work and that will be cheap enough. Then the problem then is which one of the companies in the US has already withdrawn because they said, yes, we've done this, but nobody's willing to pay for it. No, no, no government, including their own, and no company was willing to pay for the further development of a, a technique because uh, although it might cost in the end less than $40 a tonne, who's going to pay that $40? The, the people of the world have got to, the governments of the world have got to be prepared to pay to, to implement a system that works. And one sort of thought, one, when one thinks about the world, you sort of always think everybody wants the best for the world. But it's not true. I mean, there were, there were lots of people who couldn't care less. And you can imagine how, say, if uh, a, a nation that's uh, if elected, say, <laughs> Trump, or, or in Britain, <laughs> Theresa May, though that, a nation like that might be, the people might in general be so selfish that they don't want to spend their, their hard-earned money on something literally pie in the sky that, that will clean up the atmosphere and it will take years or decades to get rid of enough CO2 to bring the, the, bring the temperature down. So people will say, well, why should we pay for that? And you can see how there'll be a huge political battle to get direct air capture working. But it has to work and it has to be done because that, I think that is our last chance. And that there are intermediate things, which, one of which I'm, I'm working on myself, which is um, geoengineering. And in geoengineering, you put a sticking plaster on global warming by um, increasing the amount of, of reflected radi radiation from the surface of the planet. So you cool the planet, but you don't do anything about CO2. So it, it continues to do its nasty work. It continues to make the oceans more acidic. And so all the, the bad consequences um, uh, biologically of CO2 still continue, but at least the temperature, temperature effect is reduced. And the method that, that, uh, that there's two methods that are favored. One of them I, I, I think is a bit, is not good. That's releasing um, aerosols into the stratosphere. You have to get them up there by rockets or high-flying planes or balloons and the, the powder spreads out in the atmosphere and lasts for months. It spreads around the, the whole world stratosphere then gradually falls uh, out and has to be replaced. But while it's doing its thing, you can't control the effect. If, if this is, has some unusual effect, like affects the monsoon, well, you can't do anything. You have to wait till the, it's all come out of the atmosphere. So it, it could have very bad effects which can't be controlled. But the alternative, which is the, my favourite method, is, is called uh, marine cloud brightening. And here's a, a, a sort of 
newspaper's view of how it will work. You, you, uh, you have a, an unmanned ship um, with three tall masts, and inside the masts you have uh, tubes where you're pumping seawater up to the top of the mast, and when it comes out the top of the mast, you inject it into the bottoms of low-lying clouds. Uh, that's um, uh, the, the sort of uh, stratus clouds that you get uh, at sea for about 40% of the ocean and over a lot of the land masses, like Britain is always covered with grey cloud. And, that, and it brightens the cloud because the, if you f use a fine nozzle for the seawater, uh, it goes up through the nozzle, evaporates and produces tiny crystals and the crystals get into the cloud and m make the cloud whiter. The crystals have to be the right size but, but there's an effect that's been, been uh, discovered and measured called the Toomey effect that, that uh, if you take a cloud with, with uh, droplets in it or anything in it um, and the droplet size is big um, then the t cloud will be dark, like a rain cloud. It's about, but if you have the same amount of liquid in it, but in the form of very finely divided uh, particles, like a, an ice cloud, then it's brighter. So the idea is to make low clouds more like ice clouds, not with ice, but with salt crystals. And uh, it's test been tested out and it works. So the idea is to have these unmanned ships drifting around the ocean and you need about three or four hundred of them, and they would, that would be, and it's not that expensive, um, and that will be enough to hold back global warming, and, uh, and while you use that time that you've got to do something more serious, like um, direct air capture. So my view is we probably need to do geoengineering. If we do, we should use, try something benign like marine cloud brightening rather than something poisonous like uh, aerosol powders in the upper atmosphere. And meanwhile work, uh, work flat out to develop direct air capture. So with, with that I think we can save ourselves uh, if everybody really, the whole world, devotes itself to that as if, as if it's as if, if the world, for instance, if, if a, an asteroid was seen heading straight for Earth. Every, the, the world would get together, would spend as much money as you needed to build all kinds of spacecraft equipped with nuclear weapons or whatever science fiction says you should do to divert this asteroid, stop it destroying the Earth. But global warming is like a slow motion asteroid threatening the Earth, complete destruction to the Earth. But we, we have time to do something about it but at the moment we don't seem to have the will. But if, if we had the will as well, we could save ourselves by, I think, the uh, direct air capture method. Um, and uh, so that's my conclusions. <laughs> I've got some time for questions. So that, that global warming will continue to develop unless we do something. Um, reducing our carbon emissions isn't fast enough and won't, won't do the job because of the persistence of CO2 in the atmosphere. So um, we need to do something more drastic and uh, we need, I think, to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere directly and make that the new Manhattan Project for the planet. Um, and in the meantime, we can try out this cloud brightening as a way of keeping ourselves cool while it all goes on. That, that's, that's my hope, so I don't feel we should give up hope, but I do feel all the things that are happening at the moment are bad, so, so we, we need to do this very urgently. <laughs> so, uh, questions? Or? Just say a few words about uh, what's the situation in the Antarctic, and are there scientists studying over there? Oh yes, there's, there's a huge effort going on in the Antarctic. Uh, at the moment, the, the sea ice wasn't retreating in the same way as it was in the Arctic, but it's now started to retreat. And the fear, the biggest fear in the Antarctic, is 
um, there's, there's certain gl out glaciers, outlet glaciers from the ice sheet which are quite finely poised that if, if they melt at the bottom they, they come away from the bed, from the seabed and you get a big emission of water. So the, the fear there is that there'll be kind of jumps in global sea level produced by if, uh, unexpected events in the Antarctic ice sheet. And uh, that's why really it needs to be studied more intensely to, to improve the prediction of, of uh, events which might lead to uh, emission of water and, and increased rate of global sea level rise. <laughs> For your sea mist machine floating on the ocean, what would power those sea mist um, blasters? Uh, well, it, it's uh, it, the, 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 the designer of this is Stephen Salter, who's a brilliant engineer um, and was the, one of the early designers of wave power machines. So he always comes up with perfect blueprints. So he's ready, he's ready to go. All, all he needs is somebody to give him a few million to start. Uh, but the way it would work is that the, 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 the ship is unmanned, but those, those uh, three tall masts you saw are actually flatner rotors. That, that's a method of propulsion that was developed in the 1920s. They're, they're rotating cylinders. Uh, it's actually wind power, but the, the rotating cylinder reflects the wind and gives you a thrust in a direction diff uh, at right angles to the wind. So. Uh, you had Fletner rotor ships, and, you, and you, you have them now. Some ships, Japanese ships, for instance, have been fitted with Fletner rotors to improve their fuel economy. So he wants it to be 100% Fletner rotor, so it's, it's, it's wind-powered. And then the, the pumping action, the energy for that comes from a, a turbine, underwater turbine, that draws on the, the difference in speed between the ship and the water. So it's entirely self-contained, there's no external source of power. Um, two decades ago, on an airplane, I met two young men on the way to Africa um, to, with a, an idea to solve the, 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 the drought, uh, the, the extreme drought. And what they had done was created two bowls. It reminded me of what you, the discs that you showed. Hmm. And they were, sh they were very, very light to be made of the local material, so that would give jobs to the people around them. The bowls were to be placed on the freshwater few that they had, the, the freshwater air lakes or ponds, and that would keep the, the water the evaporation rate down and at the same time allow sunlight, because there are discs and there is part, hmm. for air to come in. And I'm wondering what it would be like to have these discs that you've shown in, in also in a bowl shape, facing down, to stop some of the evaporation. Um, yes. Uh, I, well, I heard a long time ago that that's something like that had been developed in Israel, but then I never heard any more about it. Um, and uh, the, the problem is there's a, a group working in, in, actually in California at the moment, and I, I'm uh, in touch with them, uh, to to try to reduce to bring back sea ice. And I mean, one of the things about this um, uh, um, marine cloud brightening is that you can target the, you can target a part of the world by having instead of having randomly placed uh, ships, you you if you place them according to a model of where the winds take. The, the clouds, you can get the cooling effect focused on a particular area. And uh, we did a study that showed that you could focus the cooling effect on the ice edge region of the Arctic. So you could have a subset of these ships could be aimed at cooling the Arctic and bringing back the sea ice, and then that would help you to uh, survive or, or not have that big methane outbreak that everybody's afraid of. So th that's that's targeting an area. Um, but the, there's a lot of people who've come up with targeting the Arctic by putting white stuff all over the, the ice. And uh, this uh, group in uh, California has that idea. You, you use a kind of fine, 
hollow grain sand which floats and sp spreads all over the ice and the water. And I think it's unrealistic because of the scale involved that, that uh, you're trying, you need to cover a few million square kilometres with this sand. So the cost will be astronomical, not to mention the fact that the sand's probably then eaten by the fish. So it makes the problem of, of <laughs> plastic in fish stomachs a kind of minor compared to, to sand in fish's stomachs. So um, it's, it, it, the idea is you, you, you spread something on the surface to increase the albedo and, uh, and get rid of radiation, get the radiation reflected. So I suspect this method with the, the, bo the, the bowls uh, for focusing energy, you'd n it wouldn't work because of the, si the scale you'd need. You'd have to have millions of square kilometres of plastic bowls and the factories to produce them will be emitting <laughs> billions of tonnes of CO2 every year. So the scaling factor usually kills off ideas like that. Um, and there's very few of them survive into thinking about what can we try and make this work. Uh, once, once you do the, the maths on, on costs and, and energy costs, it, it, it doesn't look good. Okay, any more, any more questions? <laughs> You've got two, point, two minutes and 23 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> at the level, at the personal level, here, <laughs> at the personal level, what would you suggest that each one of us can contribute to avoid this disaster? Well, I suppose it would be the, the normal things that uh, that you should do as good citizens to, uh, in terms of minimizing energy use and uh, carbon emissions and so on, but. Uh, the main thing, I guess, will be political, that you have to kind of urge your um, elected representatives to take this thing seriously. First of all, to take seriously the fact that we are being threatened by a slow-moving asteroid which, will, which could destroy all life on Earth unless we do something. And the thing we have to do is to find a way to get rid of CO2 and from the atmosphere, and we could do it if we just spend enough uh, and take it seriously enough to do to do that. So um, it would be, um, there was a British science advisor to the government said, if, if we all did a little, the result will be a little. And, and it's a kind of cynical thing to say, but sadly true. If we all live as good citizens individually and do the best we can, the impact on the world is, is good, but it's not it's not decisive. Whereas if we all get together and tell our elected representatives, you better do this, do something about this quick, or you know, you're out on your ear, we're not going to vote for you anymore, then that, that, that might have a, a bigger effect. So, so I guess p political activity would be the thing. But aiming it in, a, in the cause of saving the world rather than party politics. Oh, that's, that's great. That's, that's good. That's good. Mm. Yeah, it, you, you have to... You could find a party that actually has an agenda like this and, and push it, but um, not many of them do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.